Einen schönen guten Abend, meine Damen und Herren. Mein Name ist Gerald Bast, ich bin der Rektor der Universität für Angewandte Kunst, der stolzer Hausherr dieses wunderbaren Raumes. Ein Raum, den wir bespielen, nutzen, positionieren als Ort des disziplinenübergreifenden Dialogs, als ein Ort, in dem unterschiedliche Menschen aus unterschiedlichen Sphären der Wissenschaften, der Künste, Wirtschaft, Politik vernetzt werden, zusammenkommen, weil das ist es, was fehlt in dieser Gesellschaft, das ist es, was wir brauchen, um diese Gesellschaft weiterentwickeln zu können. In diesem Zusammenhang haben wir eine Kooperation begonnen und das ist hier die zweite Veranstaltung im Rahmen dieser Kooperation. And therefore I, I thank a lot Uh, to Mr. Glenny, the, the head of the Institute for Human Sciences. Uh, I also thank uh, the second cooperation partner, the Bruno Kreisky Forum for International Dialogue, and of course uh, uh, the host and uh, dialogue partner, uh, uh, the one many of you will know from uh, various uh, events, uh, in the media, live or on radio, uh, Philipp Blom. He will uh, introduce uh, the guest, uh, but now I would like to hand over the microphone uh, to Mr. Glenny uh, to say a few words. Uh, I say thank you for coming. Uh, I wish you an inspiring evening and hope that you will come to other events. Uh, we have a lot of uh, program uh, all over the year. Uh, please visit our website. Uh, it's uh, a special venue, not only in terms of architecture. Thank you. Gerhard, thank you very much. It is, of course, spectacular in terms of architecture, and we feel very privileged Uh, to be able to use this space uh, in, in particular. Um, welcome to this evening's event. It's a special event as far as I am concerned because tonight's guest, Natalie Tocci, is a fellow at the Institute for Human Sciences and an extremely valued fellow. You will hear from her biography that doubtless um, Philip will uh, uh, introduce. Um, just how accomplished she is, and also just how influential she is in terms of contemporary uh, European thought. So thank you, Natalie, for coming all the way from Rome uh, to talk to us uh, this evening. And uh, with that, I'm going to hand over to the legendary Philip Blom <laughs> to, uh, to conduct tonight's proceedings. <clears throat> Philip, over to you. Come and join me. <laughs> um, Natalie Tocci, everyone. I am very happy uh, to be here um, and also very happy to do this series. This won't be a long preface. Um, together with such distinguished institutions, um, Gertrud Auer can't be here tonight for family reasons, but she sends you her regards. And, well, let's, let's dive straight in. First of all, Natalie Tocci is the director of the Instituto Affari Internazionali in Rome, the Institute of Inter International Affairs. She has been a fellow of every great institution you can think of. She has taught at many universities and she has written a number of very influential books. She has also worked in and for and with the European community, has been a special advisor there and just a few books because these, I think, will give the tone of the evening, um, the tenor of the evening. Perhaps not so much Turkey's international, Turkey's European future, but certainly the EU's civil society and conflict, the EU's global strategy and a green and global Europe. Um, Natalie, the EU's global strategy, you are 
an optimist, and that's such a wonderful, real, r rare creature to talk to. It's a little bit like finding a unicorn. Um, you have formulated a global strategy for the European Union, and you think Europe can pull this off. Now, let me tell you from my perspective, I'm living in a continent that is old, tired, demoralized, borderline dysfunctional, and if we have one saving hero at the moment, his name would be Vladimir Putin, because he has worked so much for European integration that we really need to give him some sort of medal, because otherwise the whole thing would just fall apart. Um, there's also the problems in Europe set up, um, but why do you think that Europe is in a good position to forge its own future? Well, firstly, thank you. Oops, that's as loud. Um, thank you very much. I mean, this is actually my first time in this building, and I'm like in awe, literally. I mean, it's it's incredible. So it's a real privilege, really, to be to be here tonight. Um, so, so why is it that I'm I'm an optimist, um, or why is it I'm an optimist now? Uh, I think it's fair to say that for a while, Europe really had lost its bearings. And by Europe here, I'm specifically talking about the European Union, the European Integration Project. Essentially, between round about 2005, up until, I would say, the pandemic, um, Europe had basically lost that art, that Jean Monnetian art of transforming crisis into an opportunity for integration. So basically sort of, you know, beginning with the 2005 constitutional treaty crisis and then 2008 onwards, Eurozone crisis, the migration crisis, Brexit. Um, it is true that the European Union didn't collapse. I mean, we were there teetering on the brink, uh, but we didn't fall over. Um, but we had lost that art of using these crises to make a step forward. Um, and so in the best of circumstances, you know, Eurozone crisis, we just about avoided collapse. You know, we just about did enough to avoid collapse, you know, half-baked banking union. In the case of the migration crisis, we did nothing. Uh, and in fact, luckily enough, it was only a crisis in political terms. It wasn't really a crisis in terms of numbers in the big scheme of things. Had it been a real crisis of numbers, uh, not doing anything would not have been enough. And by doing, here I'm again talking specifically about using the opportunity to make a step forward and therefore specifically in the, in, in the case of migration in terms of EU asylum and migration policies, it didn't happen. There was this assumption that by simply agreeing, you know, working on the border and external dimension of it, you know, probably the most notable example being the 2016 agreement with, uh, with Turkey, that that was sufficient and literally we did nothing as far as the internal dimension is concerned. Now what happened, and here comes the optimism, what happened with the pandemic and now with the war um, is that we rediscovered that art. So, you know, you take the case of the pandemic and frankly speaking, you know, public health really was not an EU competence and is not really an EU competence. Uh, and yet, because of the very nature of a pandemic, which is transnational in nature and therefore um, national governments alone were and would have been unable to deal with it. Um, you know, in, in a typically sort of functionalist uh, European way, part of that, you know, dealing with that, with that crisis had to be bumped up to the European level. And I think largely, you know, in terms of vaccination rollout, in terms of especially the economic implications of all this, next generation EU, Basically, that crisis was turned into an opportunity for, for integration. Interestingly, and this then comes closer also to the topic of my last book, it became a way of substantiating financially what the EU had already decided was its next big thing, which was the European Green Deal. Now, when the European Green Deal was first announced, it was a great idea, a great plan. It really had no money behind it. And, and then comes the pandemic and whoops, you know, 750 billion euro, 40% of which 
channeled uh, to, the, to the transition. So the transformation of that crisis into an opportunity. Now, likewise, I think that a similar argument applies in terms of Europe's reaction to the war. Um, especially if you look at it through, I would say, both the defense, on, on defense, I'm slightly more pessimistic, but perhaps we'll get to this later, but both on defense, especially on energy, and to a small extent also on refugees, thinking about the first ever activation of the temporary protection uh, directive uh, for refugees. Again, there was the use, quote unquote, of a crisis to become an opportunity for integration. I say especially on energy because I actually think it's quite remarkable. Again, you know, let's all bear in mind that energy is essentially, especially energy mixes, are national competences. Uh, and with widely divergent levels of dependence on Russian gas, um, and with especially a number of countries really having to go hunting out for gas elsewhere and risking to compete with one another, it could have ended up looking very nasty indeed. It didn't. Hmm? Why didn't it? Well, that's the thing. It was the rediscovering that art of understanding that simply by acting at national level it wasn't going to work. And so basically what, what happened was there was a diversification of fossil sources. Huh? So we diversified how brown we were, which meant that we're no longer dependent on only one nasty brown. Huh? We're maybe dependent on many nasty browns. Um, but if you're dependent on many, then you're really not dependent on anyone. Um, I think the coordination on the gas storage was really quite remarkable. And now the way in which this is being used, the method of the vaccination procurement is now being applied to gas storage for next winter. Really interesting. And to kind of loop back to the point I was also making about the Green Deal, the crisis was used to accelerate the legislative agenda on the implementation of the Green Deal, and in particular, Fit for 55. This wasn't at all granted. In fact, probably had we had this conversation a year ago, when Repower EU was being published, I would have probably said, this is a little bit fanciful. I mean, it's not gonna happen. Energy security is back. We're gonna forget about the energy transition. Actually, it was used to accelerate the energy transition. Now, there are so many things um, in your answer that I'd like to unpack, but Let's start at the beginning. You who knows the European community and its actors so much better, how was it possible that a union that, yes, had been slightly galvanized through the epidemic, but was basically an administrative and perhaps economic union, rediscovered its political nature um, through the war in Ukraine? Because that, to me, is the most remarkable thing, that Europe has been rediscovered as a political project, as an almost historical project, or historic project. And that is a shift that may not be very evident, but I think it is very momentous. How, could that, how was that possible? Well, so I would say, firstly, that um, the intention to go in that direction was already there. I mean, you know, uh, let's recall the fact that the Juncker Commission had defined itself as a political commission. Why was it thinking in political terms? Because of course it was already obvious that the kind of gray Brussels was increasingly seen as detached from the needs and desires of ordinary citizens, and so it needed to reconnect to citizens. Kind of didn't really succeed in doing so, uh, but the intention was there. When the von der Leyen Commission came in, well, she defined her commission as being a geopolitical commission. So not only political, but political in, you know, with, with greater awareness of Europe's place in the wider world. Uh, and again, the intention was there. Now, in a sense, that potential was then realized with the pandemic and especially with the war, I think to a large extent, well, both thanks to a point that you were making earlier, 
which is thanks to Vladimir Putin. <laughs> uh, and so here we are, we'll probably have to kind of erect a statue uh, for Putin in Hongkwan Schumann, and probably in Evertu, because it kind of, you know, reinvigorated NATO in, in you know, incredible ways. I mean, NATO was the brain dead organization, right? Only a few years ago. Um, so partly was because of that external threat, and that's the negative side of the argument. But then I think it's that there's, there's the positive, and the positive is actually Ukraine itself. Uh, I mean, all of a sudden, um, here is a war, here is a people and a country that is um, fighting a war of survival because it actually wants to be in us right? Um, it wants to be more like us. We'd kind of forgotten about this. I mean, I think the way in which the war brings back um, the idea of enlargement, and this is something that, frankly speaking, had kind of withered away, um, because you could actually say, well, you know, that political sense was there back in the, you know, end of the 90s, early 2000s, the imperative of reunifying Europe through enlargement. And then what happened was that we kind of did it. Uh, and especially after, you know, 2004 and especially 2007, and yes, indeed, Croatia comes in in 2013, but basically that project starts withering away. Uh, and of course, we were all self-absorbed by our own internal crises. And then, and then the war happens. And, you know, the fact that uh, Ukraine applies for EU membership three days into the war when, you know, at first sight this looks like this should be the last of their priorities now, and yet the fact that it happened then really, I think, speaks of that political project that we were kind of, we'd forgotten about and Ukraine reminded us of. A European Union with a Ukraine will be a very interesting prospect to, to ponder. Um, that is for the future, but I mean, Europe would gain not only a country with a very special moral uh, status after this war, but also a country with a very large population. I think it would be the third largest member of the EU in terms of population, so it would have um, a very considerable weight as well. Is that... Um, is that feasible for Europe? Well, I, I'll make it even more complicated because uh, a Europe with Ukraine is not just a Europe with Ukraine. Uh, if that enlargement imperative is back, then yes, we're talking about Ukraine, we're talking about Moldova, we're potentially talking about Georgia and in general the South Caucasus. We're certainly talking about the Western Balkans and dot, 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 what about Turkey? What about if, you know, in a few days from now, things change in Turkey? Uh, and that different Turkey that gets back on track on democracy and rule of law and all good things, um, comes and knocks at the door again saying, hey, we're not really interested in doing the transactional deal on migration anymore. We're actually interested in that political project. What do we say to them, right? Now, on the one hand, um, you could say, well, it's, it's impossible right? for, for reasons that you were hinting at. I mean, institutionally, this requires basically a revolution, and, and I think that's absolutely right. But I think the point about the war is that it's awakened us to the reality that the alternative of not doing it is equally impossible, in the sense that there was this illusion, I think, as I said, beginning in you know, the late 2000s, especially over the course of uh, the 2010s, that there was, there was the European Union, uh, and yes, there was a Russia that was becoming increasingly assertive and aggressive, and then there was this kind of gray zone. And the gray zone was you know, not perfectly democratic and not perfectly prosperous and not perfectly secure, but it was kind of more or less stable, you know? And the debates about the Western Balkans, you know, people talked about stableocracy. Uh, that was not ideal, but was kind of more or less okay. We could live with that. What the war has made extremely obvious is that you're either on one side, you're either in, and if you're out, bad things can happen. And those bad things are not just bad things for the place where it happens, in this case Ukraine, but they have consequences that are devastating for the European Union. So 
there is a cost to non-enlargement that I think the war has awakened us to. So yes, there is a cost to enlargement, there's an perhaps even higher cost to non-enlargement, and to make that cost point perhaps even more obvious, just think about reconstruction. So we know that the reconstruction of Ukraine will cost several, uh, you know, 200, 300 billion, we don't quite know, but more or less this is kind of what we're talking about. Um, here we are in a Europe in which we need to spend on defense, we need to spend on the energy crisis, we've spent a lot already during the pandemic, uh, and now we have to spend on the reconstruction of Ukraine. Now that becomes a feasible proposition only if it's not just public money, but there's private money as well. Now, which is the private company that will go invest in the reconstruction of Ukraine if there aren't, you know, if, the, if there aren't sufficient guarantees, this, by the way, brings also, obviously, the question of NATO in, but just to limit the discussion to the European Union, that, you know, a context in which the private sector actually has an incentive to, to invest. And if the private sector doesn't invest, it just becomes an intolerable price for, for governments, right? So there's a cost to not doing it. Now, then comes your question, right? So if you've got to do it, and yet if you do it, it's disastrous. <laughs> how, what, what, you know, how do you go about it? I mean, I, I actually fundamentally believe that there will have to be, in any case, ways of graduating this. So in a sense, acting, at least beginning by acting on many of the good ideas that were in circulation in the past. You know, you enter the single market and, you know, you can enter bits. There have been very interesting ideas that people have worked on concerning the fact that um, you enter but you no, don't necessarily have veto rights, at but least for is, a while. But that, that I found that very interesting. Um, I read today or yesterday that Olaf Scholz is working to end the unanimity rule in the, in the European Union. Is that a preparation for an enlargement in which this, which has been impractical for a long time, would be completely disastrous? Well, you know, I mean, ideas on how to go about uh, getting rid of unanimity have been circulating for, for a while. And, you know, um, von der Leyen herself, I mean, she has, back when, you know, to the European Parliament, when she was, uh, you know, when, when, when she was then nominated and, and elected to become president of, of the European uh, Commission, she made the point that, you know, you can start with some issues, sanctions, human rights issues, um, the, uh, uh, the voting on common security and defense uh, policy, missions and operations. I mean, if you're not planning to participate in one, why on earth should you have the veto on whether others uh, can proceed or not? So, you know, you can start on bits huh, uh, of, you know, getting rid of unanimity rather than going for the full Monty uh, straight away. Now, of course, as I said, these ideas were in and have been in circulation for a while. And of course, there are typically smaller countries that resist and they resist because they know that the larger countries will always uh, have, you know, sufficient uh, votes to block things uh, uh, if, uh, if, if things go in a direction that is not of their liking. Now, how has, again, the war started to change the conversation? Well, that many of these countries, and here I'm specifically thinking about East European countries, um, are living with the consequences of the costs of unanimity. I mean, how obnoxious has Hungary been? And not just, you know, beginning for countries in Eastern Europe. Now, it is true that ways and means have been found to getting around Hungary, including developing forms of internal economic conditionality, which is, I think, another extremely interesting development within the EU. But I think, you know, sort of the, the way in which, you know, sort of context matters, right? So the way in which the EU has uh, reacted to the war, has brought back this question of unanimity um, and has made relatively old ideas, um, it's made them come back to the agenda. I don't kind of wish to suggest that therefore it's a done deal and we're therefore going in this direction, um, but, but the fact that we're talking about it, <laughs> I think signals uh, the way in which things are headed. Now, 
your strategy for Europe is pretty hair-raising at first sight because um, we all know that energy transition is complicated and very expensive and we really can't do it and zero carbon economies really exist in the heads of academics or great idealists but the world is made of different stuff and if this happens then perhaps incrementally over a few centuries but um, you know this is nothing for tomorrow and you say yes not only is it possible for tomorrow but also in this transition in making your in, in a real green revolution a real zero carbon continent lies europe's big chance for not only surviving but also finding a global place which is i think very important as well because well as we all know there's china and there's america that give models and power and have global influence and if Europe is not at that table that means that European models and interests will not be heard. So tell us how is this supposed to work? Okay so I, I, I think it will happen um, much faster than a few centuries. <laughs> Let us um, hope so. Uh, well I'm, I'm in fact I'm sure about this. Uh, I'm absolutely sure about this, and not because we're getting the policy right, but simply because technology and markets are headed in this direction. And th this I'm e extremely clear about. This, by the way, is not the first transition. I mean, the world has transitioned away from wood to coal, and then coal to oil and gas. So there will be, the there is, it's ongoing, the transition away from fossil fuels simply because it makes economic sense because of technological changes. What's the difference between this transition and previous transitions? That it's policy driven. And it's policy driven because it has to be even faster than what it would be. Uh, because unlike previous transitions, this transition is driven by the awareness of the climate crisis. Huh? Is there any precedent for this in the history of the EU, such a transition? Well, not, not of an energy transition, because in a sense, uh, the EU as a project is, has been, you know, was, 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 was born uh, in, in a very fossil way, <laughs> right? Um, but, 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 so I, I think that, as I said, this is happening, and it's happening not just in Europe. It's happening different shapes and forms and paces elsewhere as well. Um, what is the, the difference between the way in which the EU is doing it and others, and I'll come to the US, which I think is a, is a really important point here, is that we have a plan to do it. I mean, we have a plan to get from A to B. Um, we don't just have a target, we, and, and we have therefore policies uh, to get us from A to B. Um, I hinted at this earlier, but I'll just come back to this. I was, it was just extremely interesting. I was having this conversation uh, a, a week ago, um, with the Director General for Climate in the European Commission, and he was telling me that when they approved the Fit for 55 uh, package, um, in the Commission they had Sorry, developed... Sorry, what is the 50 55 So basically package? This, is, this is basically the set of regulations, funding proposals, I mean basically carbon pricing, regulation and, um, uh, and funding, I mean that's the, the three main policy avenues, to basically uh, reach the goals of a 55% reduction of emissions by 2030. So this is the plan basically for this decade, right? And unless we get to that intermediate step, we're not gonna get to net zero by 2050, which of course now in the European Union is enshrined in law, right? So no one else has done it. Anyway, he was telling me that when they approved uh, this, so this is back in 2021, um, they had developed different scenarios in terms of how ambitious they would get in actually getting the legislation through. So this is really you know, a whole range of issues, you know, extending the emissions trading system, approving the carbon border adjustment mechanism, um, approving a set of different funding instruments. Where we are now is by far the most optimistic scenario that, that they had envisaged, which I thought was, wow. So again, going back to my first point, we used this crisis in, in that productive way. 
Now, I'll come to that's the positive side of the story. Let me come to the, the negative. And this is where the US and China bit come, come in. So the EU, you know, it's European Green Deal. Uh, great, we have a plan. We're now putting it in practice. We're actually doing relatively well. This year, uh, renewables were the first source of electricity generation in Europe. Wow. No, I mean, pretty good, right? We're in an energy crisis and renewables are our first source of uh, electricity generation. Um, however, what we didn't have was, no, let, before I come to it, otherwise I'm going to spoil the line here. Uh, <laughs> the United States then approves its Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, and remember the debate a few months ago. We were, oh my God, you know, what do we do now? And if you think of it, it's like, wh why are we so taken aback by this? I mean, we had our plan. Okay, now the United States has its plan too, uh, to decarbonize. Uh, why, um, why is this creating such a commotion in Europe? Now, the Inflation Reduction Act, and this is where the snack kind of comes in, is not just a decarbonization strategy. In fact, I would argue it's not even principally a decarbonization strategy. It's a China strategy. So, essentially, because unlike in Europe, in the United States, climate is extremely contentious, it's extremely polarizing. The one thing that is not polarizing in the United States is China. So, Democrats and Republicans all agree that it's okay to spend money and lots of money if this is about contrasting and competing and slowing down, basically, China. Then you give it that green twist, basically, saying, and because you're aware of the fact that some of the, may, many of the technologies in which China is ahead of the game are precisely those green technologies. And so that's what you need to subsidize. And this is why it caught the European Union by surprise, because our European Green Deal wasn't even thinking about China. Yes, yeah, we were aware of the fact that there's a problem with critical minerals and solar panels and you know, we were aware of this before, but our, our plan was aimed only at decarbonization. And this is why now that the United States comes up with its double C plan, climate and China, we have to kind of catch up on that second C. And that means basically developing an industrial strategy, which then gets you to a whole set of other problems. How do you go about an industrial strategy? Well, that requires spending. And yet, We've already been spending quite a bit, right? 750 billion on next generation EU. Comes Italy saying, we would quite like to have more funds now, sovereignty fund, because you know we've got to compete with China. Germany then says to Italy, but you haven't even spent the money that we gave you, uh, and now you're asking for more. They kind of have a point. <laughs> um, in all this, we are debating the revision of the Stability and Growth Pact. Um, so all this comes at a time in which Member states, the debate between member states is now tilting towards we can't do more EU level spending. We still need to come up with that industrial strategy. So what do we do? We relax state aid rules. Germany is very happy with this because, of course, those member states that have greater fiscal capacity can do their national industrial policy. So there is a risk at the moment that as we try and add that second seed by developing an industrial strategy, we basically recreate the toxic dynamics that gave rise to the Eurozone crisis, but colored in green. There's another problem, it seems to me, is that what we've talked about so far has all been at the level of the political elite. We've just seen in France with a series of protests that the populations are not always in the line with what the political elite would like to do. Um, there's been rumblings about the Ukraine war and how long European populations would want to support this, um, this stance of standing with Ukraine. So, when you say this transition costs, and it will certainly cost, and it will certainly mean that there will be interference with people's private lives, with people's private choices, whether they'll be the cars they'll drive or the kind of consumption they have, um, 
haven't we forgotten something there if we only think in terms of what elites and grand plans do? Well, firstly, I would say um, that actually one of the reasons, um, so if you ask me, you know, what, what, why, why did the, especially the commission, think that green was going to be its thing? Uh, yes, it was because of the climate crisis. I would add that it was also, there was also an economic rationale to it because green meant it was a productive project. It wasn't, it wasn't the Europe of austerity, of res restraint, of rules. It was the Europe of innovation and production. So there was an economic rationale, but then there was a political rationale. Yeah, what about Fridays for Future? I mean, this was a way to reconnecting with those younger generations that actually think that this is the most important thing of all. So, I think, firstly, we should kind of distinguish what we mean when we mean, you know, the, the broader public, because actually there is an important part of the population that actually thinks that this is exactly what we should be doing. Then you're absolutely right, there are others um, that, uh, that will and are and will increasingly push back. And in a sense, even before this became the European project, um, we, we, had, we already saw, I mean, think about the Gilets Jaunes protests huh? back, in, back in 2019. Um, back then, it wasn't a Eurosceptic protest because back then, Green had still not, was still not associated as much with the European Union. But if there was a Gilets Jaunes protest now, it most definitely would be Eurosceptic. Um, and, and I think this speaks of the, to the broader question that if this is actually a revolution, because the magnitude and the speed of change is literally revolutionary, all revolutions have winners and losers. And yes, there will be losers. Now, it's not as if Europe is unaware of this. And so what it does is it develops a climate social fund and a just transition fund. So it understands that losers have to be compensated. I think we still don't understand the extent and the magnitude of that compensation. And let me just give you a figure to give you a sense. So, great, we approve a climate social fund. If you add it together with the Just Transition Fund, we're basically in the order of about 90 billion over seven years, 27 member states. You can say, well, that's a fair amount of, of money. In one year, meaning the last, b between September 2021, when the energy crisis started, and September 2022, when we were still in the midst of the energy crisis, um, European countries, I'm slightly cheating here because actually in the figure I'm about to give you, uh, the United Kingdom and Norway are included. Um, so, yeah. Uh, but European countries as a whole uh, spent 850 billion in one year. So you compare that to 80, 90 billion over seven years and you just realize, I mean, you know, they spent on the energy crisis, so on utility bills. So this is basically subsidizing brown frankly speaking. So we understand the nature of the problem, we don't understand the magnitude of it, but then to end on a slightly more positive note, um, the fact that there is going to be that pushback, and to an extent there already is, you know, I was reading a couple of weeks ago, um, farmers in the Netherlands are up in arms because of targets on nitrogen, basically, uh, that, that need to be achieved. So there will be pushback from different sectors. The fact that there's pushback, to me, actually signals that change is happening. Uh, it's, it's getting political. It means it's getting real. And yes, we will need to find solutions. And yes, that plan that I was referring to will not go exactly as planned. But it doesn't mean that the direction of travel will not be the same. There will be detours. I mean, this is it's life. Huh? But the point is remaining the course. But the Dutch rebelling farmers give you a pretty good example why these things are so difficult. Because the Dutch government has actually in response to a climate suit in, in, in the courts, um, set targets for nitrogen and the Dutch farms exceed them by far and therefore 
farming had to be changed, traffic also had to be changed, so as now, yes, it can happen in a Western European country, top speed 100 kilometers an hour on all motorways to bring down carbon, and the country has not imploded, and um, it's, people are still driving quite happily. Um, but what happened with the farmers is, I think, really interesting, because if you drive through that part of the Netherlands, as I've done recently, it's really idyllic. You see a few cows grazing in the meadows, and you see the lovely old farms, and you see their big barns in the background. What you don't see is that they, big, these big barns are filled with tens of thousands of cattle that are usually bought in other countries, fattened up there, and then exported to become jamón ibérico or um, beautiful uh, mortadella. But um, the Netherlands are the second largest agricultural exporter in the world after the United States. A tiny country, and that is only possible because of intensive agriculture. Um, in case of the Dutch farmers, they are left literally with the profits and the shit of these cows after they fattened them, and that produces a lot of nitrogen. Now, the farmers didn't get into this situation of being a top exporter just by magic, but because there were big institutions, among them the European Union, telling them that this was a sensible strategy to work in the global market. Um, now, this, this, the government, as far as the farmers are concerned, basically the same people are telling them, no, 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 you can't do that anymore. This is now evil, you must now change everything, including your investments of millions of euros into the infrastructure that you have built. So, that seems to me almost an allegory for European, the European economy as it is going. And therefore, I mean, your beautifully ambitious plan for the, for, the, for the European Union, I've been known to say the same thing about Austria. Namely that Austria would be, to my mind, one of the few countries, and I ask you to um, enlarge my horizons here, but that could very easily gain, not, do not only the right thing morally and the right thing by the next generations, but also gain a huge economic advantage. If Austria decarbonized within 10 or 20 years completely, that would be a fairly brutal and bracing process. But it would mean that Austria would develop the expertise and the technologies that are needed in these processes everywhere in the world where they will occur and will have to occur. Austria is relatively small, it's relatively wealthy, or it's very wealthy, it's got a relatively educated population, it's got great geographic luck for hydropower, etc. Therefore, Austria would be in a pretty good starting position. This is sort of what you envisage for the whole of Europe, but Europe is not Austria. Europe is many different countries on many different le levels of wealth, of cohesion, of their political project, how do you envisage what you've now described as a necessity of economic change? How do you envisage that this enormously expensive necessity will actually become a winning formula for a foreseeable future? Well, I guess I kind of look at, look at it starting from the opposite end. And the opposite end is basically realizing that this will happen. It will happen. Uh, and so the point is, how do you, let's take coal, hmm? the, the, the coal workers, uh, to talk of Poland. Those coal plants will shut down. It will simply not make economic sense to, it already doesn't make economic sense. I mean, the reason why, what I was saying earlier, renewables have overtaken coal specifically and gas, but coal in, in electricity generation is that they are cheaper. So this will happen. Now, it is going to happen and it is happening faster than it would have done because certain policies are being put in place, right? So you have carbon pricing and you have uh, funds for renewables and therefore you subsidize and you have uh, regulations banning X, Y and Z. So the, the policy speeds things along. At but the, the starting point is that it's going to happen anyway. So the government, uh, the, the political class, in a sense has to, um, I mean, that, that coal worker is faced with, with, with two alternatives. Either 
things are just left as is, and they will be without work anyway, or it, it is part of policy, and, in, and part of policy means, on the one hand, the fact that you have those accelerating policies, but on the other hand, you have compensating policies. In a sense, those two go together. The, the, the starting point, and this is, in a sense, where politics comes in and should come in, is, in a sense, making everyone realize that there isn't a world which will remain as is, simply because, as I said, it's happened before and it will continue to happen. Here's a question from an economic layman. Um, when I speak to my friends in the climate movement, I always hear that the future of the economy is degrowth. And that seems a lovely idea to me. It's very idyllic. We will all have less. We will all need less. We won't, won't need so much stupid stuff. We won't need so many clothes. And we'll all be more virtuous. And things will be more beautiful. My problem with that is always that I never get any numbers on anything. That democracies cost a ton of money. The institutions of a democracy. That I don't think it's an accident that we've developed the extent of human rights protections that we have in the time of the oil boom because wealth tends to make that kind of thing possible and now especially how do you run a degrowth economy at the same time as a war against putin wars are terribly expensive so um what i'm asking is as an economic layman all that what you described all sounds beautiful it also seems to cost an awful lot of money are we simply going to keep printing it well, but this is my point, and this is why I was saying, though, earlier that um, this is not just a normative project. It has to be, in order to be real, it has to be an economic growth project. Because actually, the, the point is that a decarbonized economic system is a higher growth system. The difference between a brown and a green economy, I mean, the point is that the transition is going from brown to green that is very bumpy. But if you just kind of, you know, make that jump into green, this is basically uh, an economy which is, um, has a much higher level of innovation and technology. And that innovation and technology is far more diffused, it's far more decentralized. You could say it's far more democratic hmm? in the sense, you know, the, the extractive, yes, it's true that there's an extractive element, critical minerals, etc. but basically this is not fossil fuels. So it is a higher growth economy. The point is that the drivers of that growth, the, the, the sectors of that growth, and therefore the people of that growth are not necessarily the same. And this is why, where the compensation comes in. So the overall pie has to get bigger. I don't buy the happy degrowth story at all, at all. The pie has to get bigger, precisely also for all of the other reasons that you were saying. But the, that, price has to, that, that pie has to get bigger and policy has to find ways of compensating those that within the pie will risk having less. Otherwise, those are the ones that will push back against that change. That seems to be normative again, um, because also, I mean, I can see that if green technologies are being developed, there are technologies that can be developed, that can be sold, that can be implemented, that makes money. I can also see that the biggest taxpayers have been exactly all the firms we want to get rid of. Um, there's, I'm still, I'm still struggling to see how we can, how we can make this work as an economic project as well as we will have to. Well, I mean, let me give you perhaps, this is just anecdotal evidence, but over the last years I've sat on the board of two energy companies. Now, in fairness, they are European. Had I sat on the board, pretty unlikely, but had I sat on the board of an American energy company, I don't think I would be saying what I'm about to say. Now, these companies don't really care about norms. They don't even care about politics. They care about making money. And trust me, that change is happening within these companies because they know that they will not have a future unless they make that change. They know that they can be more profitable uh, as they decarbonize. And, you know, they're not, they, they, they obviously um, don't buy the idea and therefore that means, you know, stopping extracting gas tomorrow morning. Of course not. Um, but they do have a plan to reduce it, not because it's nice to do that, but because it's more profitable to do that. 
It's what investors ask as well. Um, now, in fairness, investors can then be extremely fickle, right? I mean, it kind of really depends on what oil and gas prices are like. When prices are low, they want you to go very green. When prices are high, all of a sudden they change, <laughs> they change their mind. So they can be very fickle. But especially during the pandemic, when, as you know, we'll recall, that prices were very low, there was a big push coming from the finance sector to decarbonize because they wanted to make more money out of it. Now, you've given us a glimpse of a green Europe and how we can have a path there and how it can be a path that is not idyllic but is robust in the real world. What about the global Europe? Well, this is actually... I, I, I hate to kind of go all pessimistic now. Oh, uh, no, no, you can't do that to no. us. You're um, the resident optimist. We need well, you. Well, th this is actually where I think the main problem for Europe is because we have a wonderful internal strategy and as I said I think we are doing it and we're even doing it faster than what we thought we're really not thinking about uh, that external dimension at all and I look at it really sort of first looking at it what happens nearby and then what I mean I've kind of spoken a little bit about that global dimension talking about the United States and China but then there's a question about the global south, which is a term that we all detest and we keep on using. Um, but, but firstly, on that neighboring uh, sort of region, especially considering that many of these neighboring countries are countries from whom we actually buy um, quite a bit of fossil fuels. Um, now, I don't really worry about the future of Qatar and the UAE or Saudi Arabia. I mean, I think they've got enough cash to, <laughs> to work it, you know, to work it out. I do worry a lot about countries like Algeria, Nigeria, Iraq. What's going to happen when we go all wonderful and green, and they and their economies uh, have not made their trans that transition and they don't have the fiscal space to make to make that transition. I've been thinking a lot over the last few months, especially as an Italian, about Algeria. Because, of course, the, one of the main ways that Italy has had to wean itself off from Russian gas is to increase its gas uh, uh, imports from Algeria. And what do we do in kind of, you know, 10 years' time? We say, well, thanks, but no thanks. Uh, and, and then what happens to Algeria? Pop. Hmm? And then what are the consequences for us? So I think what we should be doing much more of is thinking about how to progressively green our relationships with these countries. But that also begins another chapter which is often, which is not often discussed, with is, which is simply in the case of the, or in the context of the climate catastrophe, a global transfer of cash um, not only, I mean, I, I like your argument about doing something not because it's nice, but because it's profitable, simply because I always think self-interest is the most reliable of arguments. Um, but we know that the climate crisis doesn't know borders, doesn't respect um, borders of states, and therefore what happens with the Brazilian rainforest is sort of important in Austria. And therefore, what happens with the political stability of states that we rely, rely on for food security or other things is sort of important for Europe. So um, here's another lot of money that is flowing away. Yeah, yeah well, it, well, exactly. Because in a sense, exactly the same argument that I was making internally, one can make externally, right? I mean, you could say, well, um, yes, you know, internally Europe has its climate social fund and it understands the problem, it just should kind of multiply that by, you know, several hundreds. And globally, um, you know, we're gradually moving towards, we haven't still reached that 100 billion per year in climate finance and it should be a lot more than that and we all know that and we're nowhere near that, that target. Now you add onto this problem of, of money um, the, the way in which the international system is, is shaping and the increasingly conflictual nature of it. Now, some would make the argument, this also goes back to the China-US point, some would make the argument, well, you know, that competitive dynamic is actually galvanizing 
an acceleration uh, of the transition. Well, the IRA may be about China, but it kind of also does decarbonization, and it wouldn't have happened without China. So you could make the argument that competition is accelerating, and yet I think that argument has real limits. I mean, I think we've seen it in COP27, um, in Sharm el Sheikh, and I think it will become even more obvious in COP28 in, in Abu Dhabi, that the cleavages between, in a sense, global, not well, the, the US China story, the way in which China presents itself as being actually part of the global south, which is a little bit odd, but you know, that's what that's what it tries to do. And therefore, the way in which that exacerbates the already existing tension between global north and south on that climate issue, I think is, is actually a real danger uh, in terms of moving forward on that climate diplomacy piece. So where would be a, a plausible route for global Europe? What would be the strategies and what would be the priorities? Well, I, I think what it would... So I'm, because I'm extremely pessimistic on the fact that we can get a lot further on that global climate diplomacy piece, uh, I actually think that what we should be doing is focusing less on targets that can be agreed at the global level and working more bilaterally and, and, and to an extent regionally um, with countries that in their ways and shapes and paces, etc., will for exactly the same reason as we are move in that direction and how to uh, increase, progressively increase that green dimension in those bilateral relationships. So I guess what I'm saying is that it gets much more fragmented, um, or perhaps fragmented is the wrong word, um, much more tailor-made huh? uh, and bilateral in a sense and less about everyone agreeing on those wonderful global targets which I think will become increasingly difficult moving forward. They also seem to be largely a public relations exercise. Well I think they did serve a purpose. I mean I think you know sort of the Paris Agreement did serve a purpose of putting a goal which we will not meet. Which we have already passed. Right exactly yeah. Um, but, but I think that that was important. I think that had that not happened, uh, a number of other things would have not happened. And, uh, and the fact that we will not meet that target, I mean, you know, 1.5 is better than 1.6, but 1.6 is better than 1.7, right? <laughs> uh, and so I think that having it there is, is important. But I think in a sense, we've passed the peak of what that kind of exercise can, can achieve. Now, I think when we think 30 years ahead, all of us can come up with pessimistic scenarios of we, what Europe may have become. Um, if you want, you can listen to speeches by Putin who draws up beautiful images of what a decadent and spoiled West will become faced with the virile force of the uncolonized countries um, because Putin is also to some degree now casting himself as a member of the Global South, the anti-imperialist Global South, fighting his little imperialist war. Um, if you can give us a plausible best case scenario for a Europe in 30 years, what, I mean, I always think it is important to have a goal to work towards. I would like that goal to become much stronger. <clears throat> I would like people much more to talk about what countries they want to live in and then to find ways how to get there and not just resign themselves to what the world will become and I'll just have to go with it. So what do you think Europe could really become in 30 years' time? Well, I think that um, Europe can uh, you know, remain a liberal project. Uh, I think that, in fact, Europe can only exist as a liberal project. I don't mean that European countries will all uh, necessarily be liberal, but the European integration project, which I think will be there in 30 years, will continue and can only be a liberal project. I remember actually once in, I think I was in Paris a few, a few years ago, that a student asked me, you know, can, can a fascist European Union exist? And... And I said, no, it can't. I mean, a fascist Europe can, obviously, and has, and could again, uh, 
but there wouldn't be a European Union. So I think that in 30 years there will be a uh, European Union. I just have to put a rider question on here. Do you think that is a feasible scenario that uh, that European fascism will come? I mean, we see little interesting and entertaining hints here and there. And may I just say, the Austrian constitution is not very good at protecting Austria from that. Um, this is just a little parenthesis, but excuse me, I've I've just talked to a judge who told me this wonderful thing with the Austrian real constitution, the Realverfassung, which is basically what is really done. Um, and the assumption is nobody would be so impolite as to do anything else. Well, actually, according to the constitution, the justice minister can appoint all judges, as has just been the case in the project in Israel with the huge uh, protests against that, as has just happened in Hungary and in Poland. The justice minister could do that in, Euro in Austria, it's just never happened, it's not the common practice. Um, the, the president, of course, could dissolve parliament, he is also the chief of the army, etc. So this country could be turned around quite quickly, actually. Um, do you think, before we go on drawing your best case scenario, do you see a real danger of that happening within the next decades here well, in I, Europe? I think, I think that if, if, if policy is dramatically messed up, politics can dramatically mess up. Uh, I think that, you know, when earlier I was talking about the crises that we didn't tackle effectively, I think that that risk was definitely there, you know, when we were at the height of the nationalist populist wave. But this was happening because we had really messed up on policy. I don't think that we're actually messing up on policy in such a dramatic way now which doesn't mean that those nasty things are not there. I mean, I've got a post-fascist prime minister, right? But look at how she tries to act as if she's not. And not because necessarily she's changed her mind, but because the context constrains her. So I think it could go wrong, but at the moment, actually, I think that we've gone, for the time being, past, I mean, we've, we've gone past that worse kind of peak huh? and simply because we then started doing some things not well but slightly better um, so I, I fundamentally believe that there is a connection between policy and, and politics back to the best case scenario in 30 years so so here we are with as i said a european union that remains a liberal project which still will have these you know, nasty little things that kind of pop up their nasty little heads uh, here and there, but that um, we become increasingly, uh, we improve hmm, in terms of how to handle them. I think, you know, sort of uh, the story about that I was mentioning earlier about economic conditionality in Hungary is a positive story. We kind of realized that we weren't going to succeed uh, through the kind of classic legal way, Article 7, uh, um, but we found different ways of doing it. Now, that hasn't made Orban kind of become a Democrat, right? But I think it has the potential of constraining excesses. So then if the question is, um, you know, better Hungary in or out, but better in, better in, uh, because, but because those constraints are in place. Um, I would be extremely worried to have my post-fascist prime minister if we were in the European Union. I'd be terrified. I probably I would have emigrated already, right? So I think that the EU is a liberal project that constrains uh, those excesses uh, in European countries will, will continue to be the case. I do think that enlargement will become and ha is already becoming, re-becoming a necessity, which then brings the question that you were raising about institutional reform, uh, I think we will have no alternative and we'll have to find ways of actually implementing those forms of differentiated integration that academics uh, uh, have been talking about for many years. Do you think that uh, direct elections will become possible in Europe? That we can finally actually vote for European parties that represent us directly and not via 
national parties making deals with other national parties? I think there will be a little bit of both. I think that, there, yes, there will be probably progressively some transnational lists, but then I do think that to an extent European elections will also remain largely national elections. Um, where I'm a little bit more uh, skeptical, where I think we still haven't found the magic formula, uh, not even conceptually, let alone practically, is what to do with with countries outside um, you know how to you know can you really have a liberal union that acts in a terribly illiberal way uh, with with countries outside and how do you resolve that contradiction which then goes into the whole debates about migration and and and, and asylum um, I, I, I'm, I'm still, I, I don't think we even come close to understanding conceptually, as I said, not only politically or practically, but conceptually how to square that circle. And then the question is, what about Europe in that broader global uh, picture? Um, and there, you know, there are some areas like the technological uh, and economic one where I'm slightly more optimistic. I'm very, very worried about defense. Um, in the sense that actually I think that, and this I haven't mentioned at all, but I should mention it, um, I, I think that the paradox of this moment is that although European countries and the European Union are really doing unprecedented things on defense, I mean, you know, we're sending money to a country at war. Wow, and we're doing it through European institutions. Um, we are now using the European Peace Facility as basically a platform for procuring arms, and in particular ammunition. I mean, this is kind of revolutionary stuff, right? For, uh, 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 you know, institutions that used to consider defense a dirty word. So we're doing a lot, and yet the paradox of this moment is that our dependence on the United States has massively increased as a consequence of this war. Uh, and it's massively increased because, yes, it's true that we're spending more on defense and we're doing all of these things, but of course, if you spend more on defense in times of peace, then you spend on building those European capacities that strengthen your autonomy moving forward. In times of war, you spend to refill your stocks that you've emptied because you've given them to a country at war. And so you need to spend on what's available, and what's available is American to a large extent. And so that dependence is increasing. And given that no one does anything for free uh, in, in life, uh, or certainly in politics, um, there is going to be something that will be asked in return. And that something in return is called China. Uh, and although I, I'm certainly um, not particularly dovish on China, but I think it would be good to live in a Europe that is able to define perhaps its very hawkish line uh, on China, but do it, do it on its own. And I think that actually that is going to be increasingly difficult, if not impossible, because of that growing dependence on the United States. Not to mention what will happen when there won't be the last transatlantic president um, in the White House, because we know that regardless of who comes next after Biden, hopefully it's going to be Biden after Biden, but there won't be Biden after Biden after Biden, right? Um, even, and even if there were to be another Democrat president, it, you know, he or she would not be uh, a, an Atlanticist in the same way as Biden uh, is, not to mention, as I said, a, a Republican, and that, I think, leaves Europe in a very complicated position geopolitically. So uh, the complicated position is not going to change. Um, Natalie, thank you. You've given us a glimpse of an, an enlarged and also a strengthened Europe, a Europe that has perhaps found its political mission or its political will in this world. Um, you won't believe it, you have actually cheered me up. And uh, I think you have the done the same for our public, so thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for listening. The next debate is in a hot planning phase and we will let you know as soon as possible. You already know the place, we don't yet know the date and we don't yet know the name of the guest, but it will be exciting and it will also deal 
with a, te with a topic of the future. Um, we would be, I would be thrilled to see you all back. And uh, let me also say thank you very much for the RD Foundation who support this series financially. Without your support, this would not be happening and Vienna would be the poorer. So thank you all for your attendance and thank you, Natalie, for your fascinating insights. Good evening. Thank you.